Well, on the first day of Christmas, Snake Piskin gave to me a couple of white herbs to a casino heist dressed as Elvis Presley, oh yeah. All right, I'm here at the Elvis Presley Memorial Church. So of course I'm doing a special report on Elvis. No, I'm not doing a special report on Elvis. That porker's been dead for 40 years. He went from Rat Pack to Fat Pack. Don't get mad at me, Elvis fans. I'm, I'm not trying to rip him. I'm just quoting lines from a movie, okay? You know, I'm, I'm not celebrating Elvis tonight. I'm celebrating a movie that celebrates a bunch of guys dressed up as Elvis, okay? As the director, Damien Lichtenstein, put it, all movies that get made deserve respect. Even bad ones, because it takes just as much effort to make a bad movie as a good movie. And that's really what Hawkschlock is all about. I celebrate movies that other people don't have the guts to say they like because they don't make it to the Criterion label. And the reason I'm here is because it's only about, I don't know, 3,000 miles to Graceland. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it's done, honey. Here on Hawk Schlock. So what happens when you come to LA, you're looking to make a pop action movie, you got a script, you got storyboards, you even run into a girl that you used to work with in New York, and she's like, hey, let me take a look at your script. She says, who would you want to be in this movie? And you say, well, my dream team would be Kurt Russell and Kevin Costner. And she says, hey, you know what? I need to read your script. Why don't you come and have dinner with me and my boyfriend? Now, if this was you, well, probably nothing would come out of this because, let's face it, none of us were that lucky. But in this case, her boyfriend turns out to be Kevin Costner. And that's how we get on the road to 3,000 Miles to Graceland. And by the way, the director ended up paying back this girl with a associate producer's credit, a little role in the movie. And by the way, she was also Courtney Cox's double in the flick, no wonder Costner was dating her, am I right? And now we open up in the desert with some horrible, horrible early 2000s CGI scorpions. And yet they're still better than those other 2001 CGI scorpions from The Mummy Returns. You know what I'm talking about with Dwayne, the CGI scorpion king of the ring, Rocky Johnson, Maya Villa. Anyhow, uh, we end up making our way to a hole-in-the-wall hotel and Snake Herb himself... Kurt Russell, he pulls up in his fire engine red Cadillac. He's out looking cooler than the other side of the pillow. Here what was his first film in like three years, which is more or less an eternity in Hollywood, at least pre-COVID. And a kid kicks Kurt the same way that he himself did as a kid to Elvis Presley in 1963's At the World's Fair. And Kurt runs into his mother, Courtney Cox. Yes, Monica herself is here, and you could tell she just didn't think life was going to be this way. Now, Monica herself makes sure to let Kurt know that her name is Sybil with a C, not Sybil with an S, and Kurt is just thinking, listen, Sybil, with or without a C, I'm thinking about giving you an O. And you can cut the sexual tension with an actual film cut to Courtney Cox's bed, shake, rattle, and rolling, and maybe this is how Starler was created, I don't know. Somehow now her kid has snuck in, and that's... Totally not awkward at all. Anyhow, he's looking to steal Kurt's wallet as Kurt is looking to steal whatever innocence Monica herself has left. And now outside the hotel, another cool car pulls up and we have the other 90s Wyatt Earp himself, Kevin Costner. He's backed up with a group of rock and roll goons. Now Costner is eating up so much scenery in this role, I'm telling you, he probably had to go on Jenny Craig right after filming Wrapped. Oh, and if that visual metaphor in the opening credits wasn't enough with the CGI scorpions, well, it's even more obvious as we have a giant friggin' scorpion belt buckle. It's so big, in fact, you might mistake it for a WCW championship belt, but no, wait a minute. That's just former WCW World Heavyweight Champion David Arquette. So 90s wider, meet 90s wider. We also have, speaking of the 90s, we have a Robin Hood Prince of Thieves reunion as Robin Hood's stepbrother himself, Christian Slater, is here. We even have Black Hand Jack from Black Dynamite. Arquette and Black Jack and all these guys are back there playing fantasy boxing and you can cut the homoerotic tension with Costner slamming on the brakes because he's pissed that one of them said Sinatra would put Elvis down. Nobody puts Elvis in the corner. Anyhow, he's just swigging away his flask because yes, critics suck Kevin and that's why Hawkschlock is here. Before you know it, they're back at the hotel and Kurt meets back up with Courtney and she's making Kurt pontificate about all the things he wants to do with her. Incidentally, they all have to do with her last name because she's doing that whole early 2000s trend of letting her lace thong hang outside her pants. Teenage me, thanks to the costume department, and I just have to say, with those gratuitous close-ups, that's cinematography.
Anyhow, Kurt and Costner in this uh, ragtag group, they end up in Vegas on Fremont Street. They're all glitz and glamour, extras and lights, and it's all queued up and moving to camera perfection. And we're realizing that they're all dressed as Elvis because everyone is dressed like Elvis. It's Elvis week and, hey kids, Paul Inca himself is here and he's a pit boss that hates Elvis. But we got some babes in the elevator. They all have, hi, my name is Priscilla stickers on their chests. And they know exactly what they want Santa to bring them for Kurtmas. They're getting all dirty and flirty with Elvis Kurt, asking for his autograph on not just an Elvis LP, by the way, but the Elvis LP from the movie that Kid Kurt starred in with actual Elvis Presley. They leave and he gets busy hacking into something else other than their cleavage. He's getting into that elevator. Hopefully he's more successful at it than Emilio Estevez was in the first Mission Impossible movie. He had a real headache, I believe, after that role. Anyhow, Costner and the other Elvis goons, they're getting busy Robin the money room, and I'm telling you, Nicky Santoro, Joe Pesci himself from Casino, he's gonna be pissed. They're on their way to meet Kurt at the elevator, and Costner blows away security guard with a pump action shotgun, and the dude just does a complete flip backwards, but he's gonna have to settle for an 8.5 for that landing on the head. And let's just take time to acknowledge that there's all these great actors, great locations, great action sequences, and the budget for this movie got chopped in literal half. Screw all that Hollywood accounting crap because it's a full-on casino carnage going on. We got shotguns, handguns, automatic rifles. They're all going off like searches for Courtney Cox by teenagers after seeing this flick. Costner at one point is going full John Woo with dueling pistols. An old lady still going at it at the slots. She's obviously old enough to have been there back when Bond was filming Vegas, so this is nothing new to her. A short-skirted TV news reporter, she picks up a camera after a cameraman falls over so she can grab some local Emmy Award-winning footage for the nightly news. Kurt is just arriving to that floor just in time. A security guard now is there when those doors open, but Kurt doesn't kill him. He just knocks him out because even though he's a bad guy, he's the good bad guy. Action anti-hero screenwriting 101. Now all of our Elvis thieves, as opposed to just, you know, thieving Elvis, but anyhow, they get on the elevator, and just as those doors close, give that security guard a hand and a headshot, because he just went full T-1000, splattering his head all over the wall, and it isn't morphing back. But poor Blackjack himself, he gets popped by one of the security guards, and he's bleeding out quicker than the investors did on this flick. And by the way, I blame marketing on the poor performance of this flick, because it was just mismarketed from the get-go. Anyhow, Howie Long, he's their getaway helicopter guy, and he's just strolling in. He's leisurely flying across the strip in his helicopter. He's singing a cover of Paul Simon's 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, which is kind of Kurt's theme song for his on-again, off-again relationship with Monica herself in this flick. Now, they make it back to the hotel to regroup and count the cash and Costner. He's in there taking a leak, and he grabs a cigarette and lights it as he does so. Now, this is one of those things that today's younger audiences, they just won't understand. It'll look like magic to them. What I'm saying is they would never be able to grab their vape stick, hold their Johnson, and and text whoever they are on Snapchat all at the same time. Anyhow, Costner and Christian Slater, they're having arguments. Slater's all, hey, let's do a little Fleetwood Mac, you go your way. Now, Christian Slater can talk hard, but this is 2001, not 1991. So Costner pumps down the volume with a silencer. They make jokes about peanut butter and fried banana sandwiches, Elvis's favorite, as they head off to drop the body. And then we hear and see some flashes of gunshots as Costner emerges only to drive his Cadillac right into a deer because he's graduated from drinking and driving to lighting a cigarette while driving. Now, texting and driving is bad, but smoking also kills. At this point, we think that all these main characters could be dead. What a bait and switch that would be. We cut to Kurt being laid out, arms spread out like the Elvis rock and roll Jesus that he is. But like the man from Nazareth, he's back to life. Because he's wearing a bulletproof vest, Kurt's character is definitely a fan of Last Action Hero. Arquette doesn't seem to be so lucky, he still isn't moving, and I'm sure Courtney Cox is, you know, almost sad. Now she's certainly not sad to see Kurt again, not just because he's been her favorite lover these last 48 hours, but her son Jesse James Jr. has stolen that cash. Back in the deer ditch, Costner himself, he's waking up from his coma in the car, and he's like, wait, did I not use an accent in Robin Hood, but I used a really thick one in 13 days? You did, Kevin, and I love you for it. So back into the hotel room, Kurt and Jesse James Jr., they're going full Tarantino in the hotel. They're in a little standoff, Kurt with a real gun, and Jesse James Jr. with a cap gun. It's no wonder Kurt's like, listen, bro, I'm gonna splatter some cherry pie in the wall, and it's not the type from Twin Peaks, it is not damn good. Now, Courtney Cox has called the cops, but she wants both Kurt and the cash. Say that five times fast. So they're gonna act like a happy little family and, and leave with a 
bag of books. Kurt's rocking a little cowboy hat to hide those Elvis good looks because they're all over the news now. They get in the car and the cops are somehow fooled by all this, even as Kurt makes an idiot of himself trying to back out of the driveway in Courtney Cox's car. Apparently Kurt can't drive stick, though we saw some scenes between him and Courtney Cox earlier that would argue that she can. Meanwhile, Costner, he's upped his drinking and driving to taking giant swigs from a bottle of Jack. Now Sandman himself, Thomas Hayden Church, and Kevin Pollock are here. Now Pollock is here in what is probably his second greatest performance in a film largely set in Nevada. They're discussing if Costner himself could be one of Elvis's illegitimate children. Now Elvis stole from black musicians, so you might as well have him have a son who steals from casinos, right? Anyhow, Costner pulls into a gas station. It was filmed at the El Dorado Canyon Mines, if you've ever visited there, or at least if you went there in uh, Fallout New Vegas. But here in the uh, celluloid version, the owner of this gas station, we're led to believe is some kind of perf scumbag, complete with a hot young thing who seems to be slightly forced to stay there. Costner eating up that scenery, he's like filled up pervo, and then he piles up on free beer for his drinking and driving binges. It's free because he decides to whack out the perv, and the young, obviously trapped girl, she's ready to be free and she wants to join Costner. Is he really dead, she asks. Some jumper cables might help, he deadpans back. And people say Costner has no sense of humor, come on. Have you seen Malibu Hot Summer? Anyhow, she wants a ride and she says, listen, I don't smoke, but I do everything else like an OnlyFans account description in 2020. She might not smoke, but this gas station definitely does as Costner, who's obviously watched the birds cue the box office bomb fireworks. You know, the same box office in 2001 that killed this flick loved The Fast and the Furious. Now that franchise is still going, it still has sequels being made, and you wonder why we're living in the Biff Tannen timeline. Over with good bad guy Kurt, he's having some father-son bonding moment with young Jesse James Jr. They're talking about the size of women's boobs. My mom is jealous of that waitress because she has bigger boobs. This kid's psychiatric bills are gonna be through the roof in a few years. As that beat breast poetry goes on, Costner, well he's graduated from drinking and driving to eating a big bucket of jerky and driving, getting pulled over by a cowboy sheriff. A cowboy sheriff, mind you, that has taught a ton of guys throughout the years how to whip and all sorts of movies, including The Mask of Zorro. Now, of course, Costner and him, they're gonna quick draw here, have a little shootout because why not? That still makes more sense than anything that's happened in 2020. Well, kids, we have actual John Lovitz showing up. He is the money launderer here, which is hilarious to me because if I remember right, he plays the spoof of Joe Pesci in Loaded Weapon 1 actually laundering money in a laundromat. Now Costner eating up scenery, he's here to keep things honest. He doesn't believe that Lovitz really has any hunting trophies, so Costner grabs a bow and arrow, which means Lovitz is here to live fast and die off screen. Sandman and Pollock, they have deduced that Costner must be headed to the Canadian border because otherwise it's 3,000 miles to Graceland. Yes, hence the title. We're all set up for our final showdown at a woodmill. Kurt shows up and it's time to go full Rio Bravo with a kid for the money. Cops show up as Costner realizes Kurt set this all up. I'm going back, Kurt says. Yeah, Costner retorts, you're going back. To the future, as he spins and blows Kurt up and over the railing to the wood dust below with a shotgun. Captain Ron, more like Captain Gone. And now we have a war zone. Why is it the actors that are always kind of like main supporting or main actors, they never dress up in full riot gear in these scenes. All the cops are dressed up head to toe. Yet you have Sandman and Pollock and they're rocking like cowboy hats. Costner's helicopter pilot Howie, he just wasn't long for this world. And Costner, he's going full postal man on anyone and everyone he can get with his machine guns. Well, Ice-T had apparently been watching a lot of John Woo flicks because he's seen the zip lines and so Ice-T's like, hey, I'll one up that by tying one to my foot, hanging upside down, and go through spinning blindly firing in the midst of hordes of cops. It's about as foolproof a plan as a dual eye patch snake pliskin. It's not long before Ice-T is put on ice himself. Now even Steven Seagal in executive decision is jealous of such a blaze of glory being featured in a Kurt Russell pick. So Costner, he's taking aim outside of a window with his saw. It's a type of heavy duty automatic weapon and he's going full T-800 in front of about 11 cameras, turning a bunch of cop cars into scrap metal. Now, unlike the T-800, he definitely won't be able to say that his death count total was 0.0, .0 at the end of this one. Meanwhile, the kid, he's made it outside where he meets up with his mom and we learn that Kurt is hurt, but he's actually still alive. He was rocking a bulletproof vest again. Screenwriting callback 101. It's down to just Costner inside. More laser sights are pointed at him than at a Pink Floyd show. Our soundtrack goes from Elvis doing 
my way to hard cutting to some heavy metal music because Costner, he's been in too many baseball flicks. He's going out swinging. He's also getting lit up like the reviews for Elvis's movie Kissing Cousins. Kurt is, uh, you know, he's reunited with the two things he wants to dive headfirst into the most. Monica's blouse and that bag full of money. And, uh, cue the happy ending, which means cue the Uncle Cracker. I mean, they're just going to date this movie quicker than a pair of Janko jeans at this point. Cue the Schlossgers. We got best use of stool wide herb sideburns for Kurt and Costner. Best use of abundant premeditated thong hanging out for Monica herself. In fact, let's just go for best use of man's reach exceeding his grasp for David Arquette somehow backing Courtney Cox. Best worst use of premeditated abundant CGI scorpions for 2001, Suck It Mummy Returns. Best time killing road games for Costner and his redhead. Best random end credits music video. Best way to let the spoils from the crime go to your head for Christian Slater. Best way to get to the heart of an issue by shooting an arrow through John Lovitz. Best use of a jelly sandwich for a tough guy for Ice-T. Best beat poetry for a villain dressed as a sports mascot for Costner. Pork chop, pork chop, greasy, greasy. We beat their F and A's, easy, easy. And we gave Bob Dylan the Nobel Peace Prize for literature. Best use of a Cosmo quiz about having rough sex with a man for Costner. Now this is either commentary on the character's time in prison or it's commentary on the way Costner treated studio execs back when he had the height of his power. So on my wine owner writer's face is a walking emoji generator scale of schlock cinema. I'm given 3,000 miles to Graceland. Four wine owners, yes. There's movies that are called cult classics or guilty pleasures, and 3,000 Miles to Graceland is at the top of that list for me. Anytime Kurt does Elvis, it comes highly recommended. We're not on the first day of Huh! Wait, Hawkmas. Kurtmas, right? Hawkshock! <laughs>